All right. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, delighted to have uh, Aiden back in his uh, Practical Young series. And we have Michael Conforti back, which is delightful. Over to you, Aiden. Awesome. <laughs> well, welcome to today's episode of Practical Young. Today, we'll be talking about a Jungian approach to dreams with Dr. Michael Conforti. We're very lucky to have uh, Dr. Conforti back with us. He was here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he is a Jungian analyst in practice, as well as an author. It's been translated into several languages and the founder director of the Assisi Institute, um, where he has worked in several countries um, with, at this point, 25,000 participants, bringing together the ideas of Jung and people from all over the world. So, uh, Michael, we're glad to have you back. Oh, it's, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for the invite. And I'm very excited about this topic you chose uh, for conversation today, dreams. Um, I know it's uh, such a huge topic in the Jungian sort of world. And, um, you know, I wanted to start with just a quick quote, something I pulled from um, Modern Man in Search of a Soul. And it's a real small blur, but it stood out to me when I read it this time around where Jung said, Dreams are our most effective aids, or you can almost say tools. Dreams are our most effective tools in the task of building up the personality. Um, that just seems like such a big statement to me. And I wonder from your, from your work in, in the Jungian field, um, what is this practical value of dreams? Why, why do we talk about dreams? Okay, one thing, Aiden, can you hear me okay? Somebody said they're having trouble hearing this. I just turned everything up on my side. Is it better right now? Um, for me, it's okay, but um, uh, I want to make sure everybody can hear yeah, you. Yeah, let, let me go ahead. Uh, can you say uh, testing one, two, three? Testing, test. Jennifer from Chicago said she's having trouble hearing. Testing one, two, three is a very- I think this is good. At, 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 at this distance from the mic, it's okay. perfect. Put it right close to Jennifer. Can you hear better now? Wherever Jennifer is. It's okay, we're good? Yeah. Go okay. ahead. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Jung, Jung really was a mystic. He mm -hmm. was a mystic um, living in a time when psychology was brand new and he had to prove he was a scientist. And many people say that the book he wrote, um, Psychological Types, was his way of saying, look, I can be scientific, organized, and in very detail. But his, his approach was really the approach of the, of the sages and dreamers that came before him. And when he looked at the dream, he was looking at a piece of eternity. That, from my understanding, I didn't know that quote you gave today, but he was looking at what is it that the ancients would say God or, or the, the deities or the goddess, what is it that the, these higher powers are saying to us about our life? Mm. And remember, this, this is where Jung was at. I mean, I think if Jung was alive today, we'd see him very much in the realm of the, of the new sciences, in the realm of people that really care about psyche and spirit. But he was, you know, he was a pioneer. But for the dreams, I think Jung really saw the dream as coming from the transcendent, informing mm -hmm. us about the way we're doing our life. And it was brilliant. What he did in Von Franz, put them together. The early young years, they're absolutely brilliant in that they saw the dream as coming from some objective place. So you remember, you had Freud and Jung. For Freud, the dream was all about the personal unconscious, our wishes and desires and um, illusions about our life, the things we didn't want to accept, or those forbidden thoughts, whatever, that would emerge in dream. And Jung said, of course, there is a personal unconscious. But for him, it was also the collective unconscious, which is real, really where he kind of um, planted his, his tent. And he saw this as a way of augmenting. I think another word you could say is to augment the personality because mm -hmm. we go as far as we can, our conscious orientation. We have an idea what we're going to do with our life. And we're, we're quite in control, you know, aren't we? We're, we're very good about directing our lives and um, knowing what our future is going to be. I mean, you know, we kind of create the illusions anyway. And mm -hmm. Jung said, but there's another piece of us that is much wiser, that's not as afflicted by our complexes that's not limited by our, our traumas, that's not limited by simply cultural, familial and, and religious orientation. That is much, it's a much broader world. That's the world of which the dream speaks, which is why he was just enamored by the dream. Hmm. 
And how do we approach it? I mean, I realize oftentimes this comes up in therapy, right? We bring, bring a dream into therapy and that's, and that's the place to take a dream, so to speak. That's how I've approached it. But um, if we even just talk about it here in terms of where the practical value is, why to look at the dream, where to look in the dream, right? Um, how can we sort of talk about the, the, the pieces of the dream and where to look? Well, okay. There are, there are two major features to dreams from a lot of the work I've been doing. It's for 40 years I've been practicing, right? And where Jung and the early Jungians looked at the archetypal in the dream, the transcendent, the transpersonal. And where modern, a lot of modern Jungian psychology has gone is looking at our reactions to dreams. This is what we began talking about the last time, which is a, why I say I think it'd be great to pursue this, which mm -hmm. I'm really, you know, I welcome the opportunity today because it's something I'm very passionate about. Jung saw the dream as presenting a universal archetypal issue to us. Issues of the ascent, issues of the descent, issues of the conjunctio, relationships, and you know, whatever version of whatever we connect to, our future, our destiny, loved ones, whatever. And clearly we're gonna have reactions to the dream. And you look, if you think about it, everything in life we have reactions to. People coming to this group today, their reaction. Mm -hmm. People going to a restaurant, their reactions. People going to analysis, their reactions. Many times our reactions are driven by our experiences. You say, well, what else is there? Well, this is where we get the, the, the really fine tuning of the work. I'll give you a great example, okay? I think it's a great example. Let's say two people have a similar dream. I don't know if I told this example last week, but it did stop me, okay? Because it, it opens the door to this conversation. And it's good for people that missed it last conversation too. So, so okay. it's, okay. it's great. Beautiful. Thank you. Say two people have the same dream of a sailboat. That's all there is, okay? And one person says, oh my God, sailboats. You know, I, I, I think of, you know, Elaine is from Greece. Think about being in Greece and, and say you're on a sailboat for two weeks with a special person. And it's the most romantic, wonderful time of your life, right? And your, your smiles, you're, you're, you're nostalgic, you're wistful, you, you want some of that back. You say, but some of the best memories of my life those two weeks uh, in the Grecian uh, you know, islands, whatever. Okay. Person number two, they all had all it was a dream of a sailboat. And they say, oh my God, I don't want to talk about it. And what they begin talking about, say, you know, maybe if a couple of weeks are come to us, say, well, my family died in, in a sailboat accident. And there's mm -hmm. nothing but horror. Every time they think of a sailboat, every time they see the wind blowing, they think of sails, whatever. And they're just, you know, grief stricken. So I'm sure almost every therapist, analyst, counselor, whatever, whoever works with individuals, they hear those two dreams. The first dream about Grecian loving, whatever. The second dream about the terrible trauma, they're going to say, well, the dream is about the Greece and Eros and passion and love and all that. And maybe the dream came because you need more of that in your life or you have too much of it. Or the other one would be saying the dream is coming because of the terrible trauma. Mm. Okay. And the therapist spends you know, a couple of weeks, months, whatever they need to, to work with that. And so there's some, some degree of finding a way to live with both experiences. And then eventually you feel like you really did your work of, around that dream. Jung was adamant in saying, there's a, bit, there's a huge difference between our reaction to the dream and what a dream says and what a dream is about. Now that's tough for a lot of us. But it's become very much, I would say, the, the mark of the Assisi Institute approach to dream. And we've been doing we've dream training programs almost 10 years now to look at the relationship and difference between our reaction to the dream and the dream story. Now, it, it, I'm sure it seems incredulous I, to say, well, come on, if you have these terrible, this terrible trauma about the sailboat, of course, that's what the dream is about. Of course, if you had this wonderful experience about Greece and, and sailboats and, and love and romance and wine and all that great stuff. That's what the dream is about. Jung would say, pause. There's an archetype inherent in the dream that's often diametrically opposed to our reactions to it. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine the dream is say that my hand, right? Superimposed over that many times are our reactions to it. 
And all we we don't even see the dream anymore. We see the reaction, the Greece tragedy, Greece tragedy. And that's what we work with. Now, any therapist that is good at what they do, of course they would work with those reactions. I mean, we would be guilty of malpractice if we didn't deal with the trauma and realize, of course, the dream triggered that. If we didn't look at Eros in the other one, and you know, where where is that? maybe needed some for some of the pagan pleasures of life. We all need a little bit of that, okay? Where is it in your life? So we do that. But Jung said, keep your eye on the dream. Does the dream itself say anything about pagan Greece or the, or the, wonder, the wonders of Greece and islands and all that? Does the dream say anything about the tragedy? He would say no. Your reaction again, the dream and the reaction over it, like that, right? And again, all we and all we see as therapists is like the octopus coming over the other fish. If we see all we see the octopus, you don't even see what it's what it's swallowed up. So, <clears throat> in, in many many ways, the comp a complex reaction. In other words, a complex is an energy. It's energy. Hmm. Obviously, dreamer number two has a lot of energy for obvious and needed reason around tragedy. So anytime they see a sailboat win, whatever, it triggers. It's like hitting a sore spot in the hand. Oh, and you remember the, the time you cut your hand really badly. The same with the other person. There's going to be a, a knee-jerk reaction to it. Okay. When we begin to appropriate the, the dream to what the dreamer feels about it, we've limited the scope of the meaning of that dream. We've made the eternal temporal. We've made the archetypal personal. So what else is there? And and jump in, not clear, jump at any point, but let me try to tell the story if I can. Mm -hmm. So what Jung would ask with a dream like this is what about sailboats? I understand, say I look at Andrew there, I look at Jennifer and Marina, other people, they would have their reactions. Okay, they have their particular lens and approach to the dream image. What about sailboats? Now, a really interesting way into this is by way of a, a related story to sailboats. Some of you may remember June Singer. She was one of the, uh, from the Genesis from Chicago. June Singer was in Chicago for many years, a brilliant Jungian analyst. And she wrote, I believe it was the first book of Jungian psychology for the lay public called Boundaries of the Soul. A wonderful, wonderful book. And we had her speak at a conference a couple of times. She, a, a beautiful lady. She was one of the real pioneers. And in her book, she tells a story when she was preparing for her analytic degree in Zurich. <clears throat> After she finished the classes and the training, she took a year to study for the major exam to become an analyst. And she studied from mythology to psychiatry to you name it, psychopharmacology to whatever. She studied it all, alchemy, complexes. And she felt pretty well prepared. And she comes into the exam and they say, welcome, Dr. Singer. It's a very important meeting. She said, I'm, I'm, it's, it's important. I've had my dreams about it. I'm working on it. And they said, we have only one question for you today for your exam. I said, I'm ready. And the question was, how would you explain individuation coming to self to a, uh, a street cleaner in Zurich that was like a fifth grade education? And she said, uh, you want to ask me about alchemy? <laughs> you want to ask me about a myth or fairy tales? I'm more prepared for that. I said, no, no. How would you explain it to somebody who's got a fifth grade education? And she went in and did a meditation and she reflected and she came back after it and they gave her all the time she needed, which was wonderful. And she said, I would tell them about a sailboat. And she said, I would say a sailboat, by nature of sailboats, they're guided, they are um, propelled by the wind. Wind from the beginning of time, from biblical times, whatever, it's always spirit, spirit of God. The wind often is the appearance of, of a deity. And you see it in many stories and myths and all throughout the Bible, the power of the wind. And then she said, when you work, when you learn how to sail, where I live, I'm in Stonington, Connecticut, my mystic Connecticut, and it's one of the sailing capitals. And you know, I have, I have a fishing boat, but I, I watch all the sailboats go around it. And it's just magnificent watching these people when they, they, they go like side, almost sideways and holding on the thing. But they really, you really learn, she said, how to work with the wind. You can see the imagery she's saying? 
at times you you have to hold really tight and pull really tight in time and then it shifts direction then you got to shift that way and you kind of watch your head when the, the thing the bar goes over you catch the wind that way and then you have to hold the tiller in the back if you want to go to the east or to the west or whatever so she said the sailboat and the the person learning to navigate a sailboat has to learn how to be cooperative with the wind in other words how to work with the self and in many ways, especially for somebody in the second half of life, those of us that 50, 60, 70, you know, hit that stage of life, it's not so much ego driven. It's driven by the self. Where, you know, what is, what is these, the, the higher self one of us? We, we've made enough, we've accomplished enough in the outer world. And hopefully, you know, we, we've satisfied the requirements, did a good life, thing we've loved. Now, what is, what is the self one in his final, you know, the final two, stay, two seasons of life? And she said, the sailboat represents one of the most beautiful images of individuation, of how do we come to the self and learn to work with the self, the holding and the, the tacking of the wind and all that stuff. And, and I never forgot that story. And where it relates to this example of, of Grecian association and the tragedy is both of those are the dreamers, again, reaction. However, Underneath their reaction, there is the archetype of the sailboat, the archetype of individuation. So the dream would be saying, we need, we need to work with the person as long as we need to, as long as they need on the two issues, whatever the you know, respective issues. However, and this is, this is classic Jung, he said, but don't lose perspective on the archetypal root of the issue, the archetypal root of the sailboat. And I've loved that story so much. So, you know, in terms of answering your question, you know, how do we get in with this? Often what we find is people react to dreams as we all need to. We all react to, you know, to winter, to spring, to summer, to vacation, to family gatherings, to whatever. We all have our own reactions to it as we, we need to. However, our reactions are much more personal where the dream is much more archetypal. And Jung said, keep your eye on both if you're going to do this work. You need a kind of double vision. And... In terms of, you know, how do we approach it? Again, your question, I think it's really your question. One thing is ask, what is the dominant universal theme of the image, the sailboat? And again, most of us, and in, in Jungian psychology, in most dream work today, the, um, the appreciation of the archetypal is really occluded by the interest in the, in the personal. And the personal is what becomes deified and totemized for many of us. So the dream is all about trauma. The dream is all about whatever. The dream is all about your fear of marriage, all about your excitement about marriage. And we forget it. Um, the, the archetype of marriage, the archetype of Kinyon Theo. So number one, we look at what is, what's the universal theme? And then what is the dreamer's reaction to? Because now here's the other part that I find very interesting and, and meaningful. Our, re our personal reactions often determine our relationship to the archetypal. If you approach the sailboat through the image of tragedy, which that person, of course, understandably saw why they would do it, their approach to the archetypal, the sense of individuation, is going to be so jaded because of the terrible things they experienced. It's going to be hard for them to open up to that, to how do you catch all the things I'm saying, catching the wind and direction and all that and um, you know, again, when you're working with the wind as opposed to a motorboat like I have, you turn the motor on and you go, right? It, it's a much more artful way of life. And it would be more difficult for them. And that's why you, you, you keep your eye on the big picture and say, okay, it, maybe we need to slowly but surely let this piece release its, gr its grasp on the, on the archetypal issue and see the relationship and difference. And once we do that, you can say, my God, there's a story here. And most likely for, for both dreamers, okay? And this is, I'm sure, somewhat of a controversial piece. I would say almost anybody having the dream of the sailboat, regardless of all their personal relationships to it, it's going to be an individuation dream. Of course, colored by their experiences. So your question, you know, what's, what door do we go in? You know, it's often the, the door first is the individual reaction to it, but don't lose track of, What's the story? What's the innate story? 
I mean, every piece of music, every every play, everything is a certain innate something about it. Yeah, I I really love that. I mean, what I hear in in all of that that you should, I love those examples, and um, what I'm hearing is this idea of often when we have a dream with a specific image, right? The sailboat, for example, the first layer that we encounter is our reaction. So that would be based on personal history or, or our own emotional reactions, or that's sort of the first layer of, of the image. Yep, yep. There's, there's something on the other side of that, it sounds like you're saying, if we get through our personal material based on our history and our reactions, then we can ask the question, well, what does a sailboat mean separate from my personal reactions, separate from my personal history. Exactly, and that's, a, exactly, that's exactly right. Gee, uh, boy, he's asking the question, am I emphasizing the emotive element in the dream? Um, I'm emphasizing that as at times what precludes our ability to get to the architect, we need to do both. But what, what I'm saying is what's been totemized in dream work today in the past 20 years is the emotive is the key for 90% of people doing doing dream work, that's the way into the dream. It's a way into understanding. But the Jung's work, there's a whole other layer, the universal layer. It's like if you take a piece of wood, I mean, I love working with wood, right? You find a piece of wood and you send there's something underneath that and you see some rotting wood on it, some whatever, and you begin carefully cutting away, cutting away a little bit, whatever, and then you start sanding and you find sometimes the most exquisite designs exquisite grains oh my god you say, who, knew? who knew suddenly you have a hunch right? you have a hunch right and then as you begin to, to clear up and you sand it whatever and suddenly you put some beautiful oils on it the the native grains are just they just explode in colors and and vibrancy it's underneath it so all maybe maybe what you just see is you see some a little piece of rotting wood or you know some mildew stuff or some old whatever some shaggy stuff on it and you don't see what's underneath and, and that, that's where I think Jung's brilliance was. And he realized that every dream is telling a universal story. In a sense, every dream is ultimately archetypal. Because every situation in life from, from birth to adolescence to, you know, I mentioned my son, you know, the getting him and my daughter only getting ready to have a baby. I mean, it's all archetypal. Taking a seminar like this, you, you leading the seminar. And it's the appreciation of that because as Jung said, I'm not trying to glorify Young. I think he, I think he was great about this. I don't, you know, idealize Young. I respect the hell out of him what he did. But saying if we can capture the universal, we understand the mandates of a given situation. I mean, you have mandates as an interviewer, as the as person doing it. I have a mandate as a, as a person being interviewed and responding. And yeah, and it's not that you know. Of course, we have our own ideas and mandates how we want to conduct and all that stuff. But there are still mandates of every profession every activity you know in life and, and I, I find that beautiful some people find it limiting i find it absolutely beautiful yeah there's a lot to explore in that line of thought in regards to what the mandates are what the sort of archetypal dimension is of anybody's role or in the context of a dream the images of the dream uh then you know and one thing i'm hearing when you talk about this is a really um is, is a powerful distinction between the personal material and the archetypal material of, of dream imagery. And something else I would love to touch on, um, I wonder how much this relates or how much it deviates from that distinction to talk about the, the, the compensatory function of dreams. Yeah, there's, there's, the, there's the example of Jung who had a, a patient who, he wasn't even aware of the fact that in his conscious attitude, he was kind of looking down on her. He saw himself as above her and then had the dream where in his dream, you know, there was, I don't remember the exact imagery. I think it might've been a castle or there was something up on a hill and to see the patient, he had to look up. So, so the dream showed, hey, you're in your waking life, you're kind of seeing this person as below you. And um, here's an image of the exact opposite. It almost balances out the image of this patient to say, um, hey, don't look down at her, right? So um, how does the compensation function of dream imagery fit in to the personal versus archetypal material? Well, again, the, the fact that the dreams have a compensatory nature is speaking about the wisdom of the dream that it's gonna correct. It's a, mm -hmm. a self-correcting element in the psyche. And often you find what the dream will 
overemphasize is because we underemphasize it in our current life. Mm. Maybe, oh my God, I'm spending, you know, I mentioned the, the, the meals in different cultures. If someone is spending so much time, it may be because they're not in the dream because they're not spending enough time in the outer world. So you're always, you're always trying to find that, what you can call the Archimedean point in the dream. So okay, here's the issue, the meal, the interview, the whatever. And see, where are you vis-a-vis -vis that issue? Where are you in terms of caring for family, caring for meals? Where are you in terms of doing your, your professional work? Where are you in terms of you, you know, doing your musical uh, practice every day and your, and your discipline, your art? So the dream will often compensate by showing the other side. Again, it may have you practicing so much in the dream, you know, practicing 10, 12 hours a day because maybe you're not doing enough or the opposite in the dream. Right. So somebody who is like, according to the mandates of their, of their self, of their total personality, okay. if they're practicing very little, they may have a dream where they're rigorously practicing to, to balance out that, mm -hmm. or perhaps they're, they're practicing rigorously in, in their waking life. And then they have a dream where they're just out um, sailing, uh, enjoying their, their time in a mm -hmm. sailboat. Um, so it could present a, something that's missing from the waking life. I'll tell you a little story. I mean, it's a personal, but from many, many years ago, it reveals some, but not too much, I think. Where'd you go, Adrian? There you go. Many, I'm going back, God, what, 40 years now? Oh my God, going back 40 years. Bef I think it's right around I was beginning analytic training. I was thinking about, I was living in Vermont at the time, you know, from Brooklyn, but I was living in Vermont. And I found this house for sale way back in the country. I mean, even from the, 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 the big town with 12,000 people, it was an hour from there with a town of a village of 300 people in the middle of the woods. On a good day, it took you 45 minutes to get out of there. On a bad day with snow, you never get out. You're lost forever. Yeah. Anyway, I, I was really getting ready to buy this place. And I said, man, it was, you know, acreage. And oh my God, to a Brooklyn kid, you got 50 acres. Oh my God, you know, it, it's like the whole country, you know, the whole world. <laughs> and I was really serious about it. <clears throat> I had a dream one night. In a dream, this old man appeared. He was an old psychoanalyst. He's maybe in his 80s. And he said, Mike, I heard what you think about doing. You want to move here? I said, oh, I'm very excited. He said, no. That you're a young man. This is your time to be in the world, Michael. Don't, don't withdraw anymore. Stay. Go more to the towns. Forget even 12,000 people. Maybe any more than that. Do your life, do your training. Maybe when you're old, if you're older, when you're older, if you want to come out here, then think about it. It's your work right now to be in the world. And you know, some of the dreams hit you like a brick. I said, I, I didn't know who he was. So who is he? I had no idea. And then nothing recognizable about him. So I was what, maybe 27 at the time of the dream. Right? And, and he was probably in his 80s. And, you know, you like, look around and say, like, like who was that masked man? You know, like the Lone Ranger kind of thing. Who, who was that masked man that said that incredible thing to me? And I, I realized I was in analysis. And he said, that was the wise old man talking to you. Mm -hmm. That was the wise old man coming to help. You can say comp compensate in some way. My youthful attitude of, of, you know, being in the woods or whatever, that was not, it's, it's profound because it was my youthful attitude that was not understanding the mandate of where my life was going. In many ways, that was a destiny dream. Say, don't withdraw. You're, it, you've got to be in the world, do your life, do your training. Yes, you still love the country, which I still do. I was cutting firewood today, early today. And I love all that. But he said, you've got to be in the world. That's your work right now. Don't withdraw. And, wow. and, and, and it's interesting. It was somebody who was a psychoanalyst telling me all this in the dream. And you say, well, your father, your analyst. Well, I'm sure it was some mixture of all of them but it was clearly an archetypal image coming to give me guidance that I didn't have. And then, you know, those of you that have done dream work, the fact it's a man is telling you a lot of, you know, maybe my psychology, that it was a needed masculine that needed to offer the guidance, you know? Wow. But I, it's one of those dreams you, I will never forget. And, and I didn't buy the house, by the way, I didn't buy it. <laughs> yeah. You listened to the voice of, of the dream wisdom, you know? The... I listened, I listened to it. And uh, like I say, I think it was really a prophetic dream in many ways. That's a wonderful example. Yeah. And I wonder, um, I find myself curious when you give that example, does it change the fact that he wasn't somebody who you knew, right? In the sense of he wasn't your analyst or your father or something. It was this, uh, this dream image. Does that mean anything that 
That's a beautiful question. It's a, it's a profound question because the fact that it was no one personal to my personal world, it, it highlights the transpersonal element of the image. Hmm. That's, you see, you, you, what your question just hit was the crux of Jung's work, the beauty of it. He said, of course, they're the personal pieces, but then there's the transperson, the universal, the archetypal. So in many ways, you see, the way I was oriented at the point was I was going with my personal, my personal issues, and I wanted a country and, and you know, all that great stuff. And something had to supersede my values. Say, hey, listen, kid, oh, you down there, don't do it. Mm -hmm. Don't go there. So it's like the, the voice of God, the voice of something coming out saying, man, I'm, since you don't get it right now, I'm going to come from, uh, from up high, so to speak, to give you the message that you're not understanding about your life. Wow. So you, you, you would just ask the million dollar question. Yes, it was the transcendent coming through the, through the figure of somebody that had absolutely no personal relationship to. I guess in some ways it relates to... Um what we were talking about earlier, moving through the personal material to get to the archetypal material, right? If, if there's no personal relationship to that image, it's almost like you're going straight to the archetypal stuff in a way. Exactly, and, there are, and those are some of the biggest dreams we have when the archetypal really orients us. I mean, I've seen many dreams again in my career, in my, my own life and, other, and patients I've worked with, where the archetypal comes again to, to correct an attitude or to give you guidance and say, look, turn right and then turn right. No, the wind's going this way. You catch the wind this way, not that way. Mm -hmm. so, I have a, I have a question, and hopefully this is not too derailing, but I'm just finding myself genuinely interested in this. When, when these archetypal images come to our dreams, right, and they sort of give us some direction, like in your example, it's sort of a specific direction. Like, hey, it's not the time yet. Don't buy this house. Go be in the world. And in this case, it was right for you, as you, you know, and you can tell by your career, and you listen to it, and it, it seems to have been the right thing. Are there times where images come to us in our dreams and they, they give us what we might call quote unquote, the wrong advice or how do we trust that? Okay. I'm, I'm getting ready to give these seminars. I think it's what the end of the month, I'm doing it three days. I'm teaching like 95% of them. And I'm framing it as the, the story of Orpheus and Eurydice the unfinished melody, because it's all about listening. And if you check the, on the website, this is not an ad, I'm just, it's, it's exactly your question. And the point is, we often don't know who to listen to. I mean, in this story, remember the story, Orpheus, when he loses his, his greatest love, Eurydice, and he searches, he is lamenting, he lost his inamorata, his beloved. And he finds her in Hades. And remember how the story goes. Hades says, oh, you can have her back. Said, of course you can have her back. Nothing is ever lost forever. He said, but as you, you leave, you can have her back under one condition. As you walk up the stairs, leaving uh, the underworld, don't look back. So I, I don't want to say too much right now, but the issue I write about in the description of the seminar, which is what a lot of we're going to be doing is, what do you listen to? Because many times you write, the voice will say, Look back, don't look back. Uh, that's what you need to marry. This is what you need to marry. This person, that person. And you say, whoa, who's talking here? Who, whose voice is this? And there are many times, and, and I said in the write-up, I think it's a pretty good write-up. I said, and then there are always in, there's a voice of God always at present, the voice of the self, but also the voice of the sirens are always present yeah voice the siren saying we know what you want andrew we got what you want right just just look this way look to the over there won't cost you nothing man marina we know what you're looking for just you know in one of the little towns over there in russia we have exactly what you want just dive in the water and it's right there for you and the sirens will, will beckon you to your demise and it's this is part of the the real art Aiden, in dream work to begin to discern, I, I call the whole seminar, it's about an art of discernment, right? To learn how, how do you know? And how do you know what to, what to get on the menu? You know, how do you know when, when the, these different things beckon, turn right, turn left? And after a while, you begin to see that there are, there are clues in a dream. And one of the ways you find out is follow the central mandate of the story. 
follow the central mandate. It, it's, it's a real skill, okay? And it's work that gets, that gets there. And it's a lot of things we need to learn to be able to, to do this art of differentiation. But again, you're asking two of the million dollar question. Yeah, there are many times we go the wrong way. I had a, a patient had a dream and he was really considering getting married. This is a guy a long time ago, considering getting married. And uh, he, he said, you know, I, I'm not really in love. He's telling me whatever, but he's a good partner, whatever. And, and he had a dream and he was just about to, to the proverbial pop the question. He had a dream <laughs> in which the day of the marriage was there and his best friend was gonna be his best man. And the best man said, Joey, get the hell out of here. He said, get the hell out, get the hell out of here right now. This is not for you. But, 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 but the wedding and the food, I, I, I got you covered. Get out of here. I love you, but I love you like a brother. Get the hell out of here. Mm. The guy woke up and, and he woke up. <laughs> he woke <laughs> up, he woke up. But it was one of those dreams where he said, well, what, what, it was just your fear of relationships. You know, and, and, and that's where, you know, I say the Archimedean point, it, it, you have a line here, right? It's a, a line. And the middle point is get the hell out of here. Okay. How do we know? Maybe it's just your fear of relating. Maybe it's because you're terrified. Maybe because of your trauma with your mother and father and violence and, and all the horrible things that happened in your life. Maybe that's why you're running. Take off your running shoes and get in. Come on, get in front of the preacher man and do your stuff. Mm -hmm. Preacher man, preacher woman, whatever it might be, you know. You just you just your fear, and th this is what see. Part of the answer, I think, to your question is the old Jungians, the the old ones, and those are the ones I really respect: Jung, von Franz, Esther Harding, um, Barbara Hanna. They were. I have images of them like like you know with the witch's brew, with a big with a big <laughs> pot, stirring it up and see what came out of it. You know, they they weren't therapists in that regard. They were they really weren't psychotherapists where we look at therapists today. They were seers, but they looked to the dream for information about how to do life. But they, they had a knowledge about life. And they would say, like, you know, what are you doing? I mean, it's clear from your relationship, this is not what you want. Or it's clear you're just terrified. They, they had that sense about people. But again, your question is, how do you know which voice it is in the dream? Mm -hmm. the, voice, the voice of, you know, the gods or the voice of the demons, the voice of the self or the voice of the complex. This is the art. Aiden, and this is where, where a lot of the skill comes in. Yeah. And, it's a fascinating distinction. Yeah, I guess it leaves me with this feeling of um, as many more questions than answers about this material, right? Because it becomes that art of when we have a dream, where do we find that Archimedean point to, to orient ourselves how to how to translate the material of the dream and um, and I'll say in terms of your class um, for those that are here live and for those that are listening in I'll put a link to that class if anybody wants to participate because that thank sounds you. fascinating thank you and to me it's a sense of um, you know uh, to be continued as always I think with this with this material but is there anything that we missed in terms of the dream subject that that you want to speak on before we close i would say one more thing i mean i see some reaction it's the difficulties the difficult piece and the beautiful part okay it all it comes together here like a little whatever is there is a profound message in a dream in almost every dream some yes more than others like the old man in my dream whatever okay When we apprehend the dream through, all, through only, I think Jorge asked the question about the, our emotive reaction to it. Our emotive reactions, our emotive reactions. Our emotions are often generated by our experiences. The dream is not generated by our experiences. The dream is generated by nature. The dream, the dream is created by nature and given to us by nature. We will superimpose our experiences over that. And, and that often misses it. I mean, my teacher, I mentioned Dr. Yoram Kaufman, and you'd appreciate this because he, he was also a, a musician. He said as a kid, he loved going to operas. He grew up in, in Israel. And he said what he loved, he would get a piece of music that he really loved, say one opera. And he would listen to different composers doing the piece. Like I happen to love, I think I mentioned last time, um, Gorecki's Third Symphony. You know, you know the piece, Symphony of Sorrowful Songs. 
and you listen to, um, okay, um, I forget her name, the great soprano who does it, Dawn Upshaw. Dawn Upshaw is one, then the Polish ones that do it, and different composers, different composers, um, or different, what do you call, orchestra leaders. Uh, what's, what do you call? Conductor. Conductor, thanks. Mm -hmm. And he said he would listen, say the one piece of music, right? Say Gorecki's Third Symphony. And he would listen to 10 different people doing that. One would do a piece, they would do it a little more quickly, or lentamente, uh, or, or you sustain a note, whatever. But he said, you know, he, he loved listening to the variation, but everyone was still about the, it still maintained the storyline. It was still Gorecki's Third Symphony. Minor variations here and there. And it's, it's the same on Broadway. You know, one of my favorite plays of all time is, you know, uh, Fiddler on the Roof and, and a West Side Story. Again, it kind of dates you, but I love those two plays. Now, if you did a revision of those plays and it wasn't West Side Story, it was East Side Story and everything was great. You know, everybody got along. That's a great, that could be a great play, but it's not West Side Story. Don't call it that. There is a West Side Story. West Side Story is Romeo and Juliet. It's the archetype of Romeo and Juliet and, and the, the, the lovers that can come together. It's an archetypal story. And, you know, when... When you deal with archetypes, and I'm saying this because I think in terms of your question, and I'll shut up, I promise I'll shut up then. It's if we say we're dealing with West Side Story, there's a storyline. It's the conflict between two opposing groups that won't allow the love to come out until the very end. And that the ending scene when they carry Tony, like the, like the, uh, the, the crucified it was really Christian image in many ways, when they carry him kind of like this, right? Carry him out. But the the, the Puerto Ricans and the other and the, the Jets, right? The Jets and the Shark, they carry them out together. It's a beautiful image of reconciliation, but it's still a storyline. And you see my point? Every dream has a storyline. If we just want to say that the movie's all about, it's only about integration. Well, it's a big part of it. It's all about the hatred of the other, the fear of the other. It's all part of it. But but part of the work is in the distillation of what's the story? What's the real story of Fiddler on the Roof? It's tradition. It's not just what Conforti thinks or Aiden thinks or, or Barry or, or, or whomever. It's a story about tradition, about being uh, in love with tradition, living your life by tradition. And also what happened is, as Tevye said, you take one thread out of the tapestry of tradition, the whole thing starts coming apart, you know, when he lets his daughter marry for love. So it, it's your to tradition, the need to sometimes break tradition, okay? So I think that's the, if I could leave the group with any one thing today, I would say sometimes let's get out of ourselves enough to ask what might this story be, okay? Yeah, I love that, Michael. That's, that's such a perfect um, ending to this conversation. And I love, um, I'll certainly be asking that question in my dreams and thoughts. And um, thank you so much for being back with us. Uh, uh, classes now that I'm a part of that and um, thanks for being with us again Michael. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Wonderful so are we ready for Q&A? Aiden shall I start the Q&A? Okay uh, folks uh, we've got four rules <coughs> for Q&A. Uh, number one go ahead and type an exclamation mark in chat uh, or raise your hand in zoom in order to ask questions just brief questions at this point um, after the uh, Q&A period, we're going to go for breakout rooms where we'll be discussing the ideas that are presented and then we'll be able to come back and talk about our takeaways. So at this time, uh, questions, then discussion, and then takeaways. It's going to be Leslie uh, and Hannah first. Leslie, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kapoori. Thank you for your talk. Oh. Um, I, I was wondering, to, you, you said that um, these archetypes, the, the dream is generated by nature. Our reaction is generated by our experiences, but the dream is generated by nature. D does, do you, does that mean you view this part of the dream as something that, that, that the dreamer didn't even possess? I, I, are, are you, th these aren't just things that the dreamer knew, but were, were, was buried. You, you almost view them as divine and inserted from outside. They're not just the person discovering what he truly knew. It's something inserted from beyond. Yes. Simple answer, yes. Yes. 
I mean, look, there, there are times the what seems to be from the divine is an amalgam of what we've been working on, like some of the <clears throat> famous discoveries, like the benzyme molecule. They say the man that discovered it had a dream one night. He couldn't figure out how to do the benzyme molecule, and then he discovered it in a dream. Well, he also put in a lot of years of work, you know. So you can say, well, the dream came as a culmination. Maybe pieces he didn't quite put together, but all the, all the threads were there. There are other times a dream knits it together in a ways that we would have never, ever, ever, ever thought about. Like when the dream says, for instance, fish deeper. You're not catching fish because you're fishing too high. You're holding your bait and hook way too high. You got to go lower to catch these fish. You got to come higher to catch the fish. You would have never thought about it. And you, you really, like the dream about the old man, you know, in that dream about that um, don't move here. You say, well, you know, was that in me somewhere? Not really. You know, I, I was <laughs> I was saving every bottle I could to get my five cents redemption to buy that house. You know, I was ready. But it came from another place. And, and sometimes you just shake him. And let's say, I think one of, the, one of the things that awakens us to the transcendent was when you realize this dream is coming from someplace that's a lot bigger than my, my world. And you shake into your roots by it. And it's, I mean, what, you, what you're asking really is the question of, is there really a level beyond the personal and dreams. And Freud, sorry, I see a couple of comments here about the, um, um, about Freudian psychology. Freud, psychology is all about the personal. Of course you knew it somewhere, but you repressed it. You didn't want to think about it or whatever. Jung is about the personal and the archetypal, that there is another level that we're not aware of. That's not even part of our, our makeup. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. So next up is going to be Hannah, Andrew, Roxanne. Jane, Linda, Jorge, uh, Madeline, and Laura. Hannah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay. The question is: In a uh, Hannah, would you like to ask the question yourself? You can just unmute and ask the question. Okay, I'm going to read it out for you. Uh, in a therapeutic situation, since Jung and both uh, Jung and Freud both transcend the literal content by working with the patient through the personal um, Anamnesis. Okay, Anamnesis. Uh, of each case, a personal story of each case, uh, while actively withholding strong interpretation, how close is Jung's theory to Freud's dream work of manifest slash latent? Is mm -hmm. your explanation and ex approach to Jung influenced by your pre-Jungian experience as a non-Jungian analyst? No, not really, because the way we're talking about dreams is classic Jungian today, classic Jungian. So you remember, uh, I mean, I think you, um, Hannah frames the Freudian piece perfectly. It's our association to the dreams, our feeling about it. And where Jung's approach is very different, it comes out in the, the story about the, uh, the sailboat, the, the example at the very beginning. Jung is looking at the archetype of the transcendent every time, and he's not going to be confined by the personal. I mean, he's going to obviously care about the personal, your feelings and all that, where Freud would tend to stay with it. Look, you know, for Freud, every symbol was really a, uh, what's going to it's like a springboard to get you somewhere else. You, you may dream of a sailboat, but then you end up uh, in a bar in Paris and having a, a wonderful night with somebody, okay? maybe a wonderful colleague and friend you haven't seen for 20 years. So then the dream he would say is about the friend in a bar and a colleague, right? For Jung, the symbol was not just a, a, um, a random thing. The symbol is telling you a profound story because the symbol itself is embedded in its own world, its own orientation. A symbol is expressing the archetype from whence it originates. So in that sense, the diametrically opposed. So no, you know, what I'm saying about dream work, it's no, this is cl really classic. Not that I need to say it, it, it is, but it happened to be really classical Jungian in the old sense. The pre, the more post-Jungian is very different. The post-Jungian work is much more about the associative feelings and what you think, how you make the dream and Jorge's comment about the emotive. That's most more the post-Jungian, the, the emotive becomes a central way of understanding the dream. So this is much more classical. Thank you. Next up is going to be Andrew, Roxanne, and Jane. Uh, Andrew, go ahead. Okay, I'll just mention a quick experience and then ask the question. So there's about 15 of us. Uh, we, we wanted to study dreams. We were friends. Uh, 
we studied our dreams, but uh, we hardly really dreamt anything. Most of our dreams were very personal. One person, however, was, I mean, flux of dreams, archetypal dreams, all kinds of dreams. By the way, they were introverted into intuitive type, just, just to mention that. Mm -hmm. And then we felt it's unfair. So it's very convenient for him because he was able to study his dreams. But we were just sitting there and we don't dream as much. So my question is, is there a bias in the dream methods? Some people seem to be more susceptible to having a lot of dreams. Some are not as much. So this is more of a, somewhat of a critique, if you will, on the stream method. I mean, some people seem to have more dreams in a sense, if that makes sense. Does that, is there a bias? That's my question. Well, you don't get more Jungian points for more dreams. <laughs> Sorry? You, you don't get more points for more dreams, okay? I mean, some people are, are very active dreamers, most times because they've spent a lot of time cultivating their relationship to the unconscious. Okay, so they would tend to have much, a much higher frequency of dream and dream recall because they work with it. like anything, you know, Aiden works his music probably every day for 20, 30 years, you know, so you're going to be more, more proficient, it's more part of your life. Um, but the other thing is, you know, other times psyche will come to you by virtue of your life, who you meet and what you do and your, your attitude towards life. So you, often you can get a similar message, but ideally you still want the dream to come, you know, maybe even you get one or two dreams a week to help you. It does make a difference. Thank you, Michael. Could I, could I, could I jump in, actually, Shrikant, in terms of the last two questions? I did want to say quickly, um, and because I'm struck by these questions a little bit myself, and to Hannah's question, I would say that I think what Michael is saying, I'm kind of dovetailing on what he is saying, but it's like the image of the dream expresses symbolically, you know, it's the best expression of something that's unknown, but the image itself is what we stay with in the Jungian point of view versus this sort of Freudian point of view of like, the image is a substitute for something else. Yeah. yeah, the, yeah. The, young, the young thing would say, let's look at what the image is in front of us. And that's what I'm hearing Michael say today. It's like, what's the image in front of us? Let's stick with that, um, not move away from it. Um, and um, in terms of Andrew's question, I'll say from my own personal experience, when my life was the most chaotic, I was having, I was flooded by dreams myself. I mean, three nightmares a night. And it didn't mean that I was digesting the material. In other words, I was still a mess in my waking life, even though I was actively dreaming. So I think there's something to be said about taking a dream and digesting it, integrating it. It's not the number of dreams. You know, Michael's like, you know, it's not the points for more dreams because the main point is how does it build up to personality? And the only way that that can happen is if the ego has the capacity to integrate the material from the dreams. You, a person could be a very avid dreamer and not consciously change their phenomenological experience of themselves at all. Um, so um, you could have one dream that changes your life. Isn't that more powerful than 10 dreams every night that you can't work with? You know what I mean? Let me, one of the pieces that may help because I, I, I think I see where some of the questions are coming from. Okay. One dream that Dr. Kaufman wrote about in his book, it's just an incredible example. Very simple, but anyway, a simple example, but profound. He says, in the dream, um, it's, a, it's of a man, a man is camping. I, and again, I don't, I don't know if we talked about it, but it doesn't matter because there's a lot of new people on today. Anyway, a man is out camping and as men uh, want to do when they go out in nature, they like to urinate on it by a tree. You know? And the guy urinates by a tree and he comes back three, five minutes later and there are thousands of ants around the urine. Calvin made what I see as one of the most brilliant uh, interpretations. You know what he said to the dreamer? Now, here's the approach. Is there anything objective? You have, you, you have all the feelings you want about why the ants are there, okay? Maybe ants are having a party. Maybe it, it's Christmas for the ants. Maybe the ants are whatever. Or it's maybe it's your Aunt Millie or your Aunt Lucy or your Aunt Marion. See, he, he would go directly and say, what would the Orient be? Of why would ants be drawn to the urine? There's one major answer. And I know this kind of goes against what, what seems incredibly liberal, but there's one major answer. The ants are gonna be drawn to the urine for one major reason, the sugar. And you said to the dreamer, my dear good man, when will you test for diabetes? So what are you talking about diabetes? You, I think you're diabetic. The fact that there's 500 or 1000 ants around that, you know, they were like thick, 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 thick. He said, the fact that so many ants around it, you say most likely you're diabetic. 
And the man went and, and Dr. Kaufman saved the guy's life. He turned out to be a type whatever, type three diabetes. And you see where the, the Freudian piece comes in, is you got a glass like this. You say, well, it doesn't matter what's really in it. But what, whatever you want to put in, you put in it. And that's more the postmodern Jungian stuff too, where the original Jung say, what's in that? What's in that? Is it vodka? Is it water? Is it mineral water? Is it tea? Whatever. Because what's in it is telling a story. And but we want to create our fictions all the time. So when Kaufman said, you know, it's a, the objective reason 98% of the time why hundreds and hundreds of ants will be drawn to urine is one central reason. And now I know it seems reductive. Believe me, I, I got that. But it's also brilliant. There are dominance in nature. I'm sorry to go on with it, but I, I, I see the... the the, the tension, it's good reason the tension's coming up, but it was brilliant what he did with it. I say, th there is a native instinct in ants to be drawn to the sugar. You drop a little ice cream on the street, you know, they're coming out. Mm -hmm. Okay, Wonderful. Well, thank thank, thanks, Aiden, for your comments. A great one, too. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Roxanne, Jane, and Linda. Roxanne. Roxanne, you need to unmute yourself. So <laughs> there we are. Hi. Um, Hello. Thank you, Dr. Gordy. Uh, I have a question. Um, in a dream interpretation class, we were taught to explain each element of the dream as if to an alien who understood nothing of our world. Wow. Um, each element without judgment or um, preconceived notions, as in you dreamed of a basement. So you would have to answer the question, what is a basement? It's in a house. What is a house? Something I live in. What is living? Um, so it really taught me um, to do each element without prejudice. So I'm saying, I guess that's uh, the Jungian way. Um, what do you think about that? I, I think it's brilliant. I think it's fantastic. Because what you're doing is you're getting, I'll give you a word now. It's the ontological. Ontology is about essence. What is the essence of a basement? What is the essence of an attic? What's the essence of a bedroom? Now, of course, there are variations, you know, for some people, a bedroom may be um, just the only private place in the house because you get 10 kids. Other people, it's the most intimate, but it's, it's still a, generally a private place. Basements are generally, you know what I'm saying? And it's a great way to practice. You know, and I've said to our students many times, practice, like right now in America, the world situation with politics. You know, look at the situation from an archetypal point of view. What's the issue? refinancing a house, downsizing, getting a bigger home, smaller home. People here, a number of people on the call, English is maybe a second or third language. There's a dominant, people living in exile. I have many colleagues from Caracas, Venezuela, and, and many of them in, the, in exile other parts of the world. That's an archetype. And then the, the point that makes it so powerful is we, the basement you talk about, or the attic, or the room, or exile, each of those represent an archetypal issue. And there are some but there are some universal themes that go with it. Anybody that's been exiled, there are certain regularities to that experience. Of course, they're different. I'm, I'm not trying to cubbyhole anything. Basements, basement can be different. Italian people love second kitchens and basements for the summer. They love it, okay? But it, there's still, the basement is generally the spot where you put the, the, the plumbing and the, the toilet stuff and the, the water and the furnaces. And psychologically, the basement often represents the unconscious, the more... Uh, basic levels of, of the personality. Not bad, just more the, the fundamental, the reptilian brain. So it's a, it's a great way. I, I applaud that. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Jane, Linda, uh, George, Madeline, Laura, Ron, Barry, and David. Uh, Jane, go ahead. Hi, thanks. Um, I, I like the idea of the Archimedes point. Um, are there any markers that help identifying that point and, and then which side is the, uh, the more or less um, side of, of that point? You know, sort of what alerts you to, hey, this is, this is the middle point or this is the ex uh, one of the extremes? Well, first, I mean, let's say, um, you know, I tend to work with some older people right now. It's interesting. I still enjoy young people as well, but say if older person dreams of, uh, of downsizing a home. The Archimedean point, the theme would be downsizing, okay? Now, what we want to look at is where is that in the individual's life? Say somebody who's still very much on the ascent in their life. They're still building and expanding. They still need to invest in the outer world. Or somebody that, you know, as in my stage, it's, it's a different kind of investment. Hopefully it's not so much of 
climbing and climbing. It's deepening what I what I do with my life. It's different when you're older, you know. And so the the Archimedean point is okay. It's about downsizing, and the archetype of downsizing is wanting to have to spend less energy on the maintenance of your life, the details of your life, heating and finances and taxes and study, you know, uh, studying for degree work and all that stuff. It's different. So you want to see where is the individual vis-a-vis -vis that issue. It's not just a house. Of course, it's a symbol of the smaller house or the bigger house. But the small house, okay, look, they, most people downsize because they want to have their, uh, their resources available for other things, not just the maintenance of their life, to pay for, to heat the bigger house, to, to put electricity in it, the maintenance of a big, you know, and they say, I want that money for me to travel. I want to study. I want to spend more time finding that master, master musician aid you want to study with. The one that most incredible one you ever heard of. And it's a lot of money, maybe 400 bucks an hour, whatever, okay? And you rather put your money into that when you hit a point in life. So to get to the Archimedean point first is to identify the theme, the theme. Then you look at, okay, where are you? Where are you, Aiden, to, in terms of finding that master uh, musical teacher? Okay, maybe it's where you are. Maybe you got to save the pennies and do it. Maybe, you know, what? it's not the time to do it. And that's where, the, where dialogue comes in. But the old Jungians had a sense, as I was saying before, they were like seers, you know, the old sages and dreamers. They often had a sense where you were in your life. So you better go for that. Yeah. Get that extra money and you find it 400 bucks every week or every other week and you go for it. It's an experience like you've never had in your life. Wonderful. Next up is Linda, George, and Madeline. Linda. Can you make any general comments about the significance of frequent, very frightening nightmares? Yeah. It's saying that, I mean, look, a nightmare, you know where the word comes from originally? Etymology is really important in dream work. The etymological root of nightmare is what? It's the horse that runs in the night, the mare, okay? So horses have a lot to do with energy. It's all about energy. I mean, Freud, did, uh, Jung, excuse me, did a lot of interpretation around horses and, and issues in the body. Okay, he did a lot of diagnosis of physical condition based on dreams of horses. Okay, so that being said, the fact of a uh, repetitive dream, repetitive nightmares, it's saying there is something that's probably most very disturbing in a patient's life going on. I mean, it sounds simple to say, but now what? Now where the Archimedean point is, there's something disturbing. Someone knocking on the door and it's really scaring you. It may be a tremendous opportunity that you're afraid of because you, the family was against it, your culture was against it, you know, or it may be something that is uh, terrifying because it's not good for you that really could hurt you. Mm -hmm. But what the analyst would be aware of in hearing a dream is the ego, right? The, 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 center, the center point in that sense of ego that has to maintain all this and navigate, the ego is really terrified of what's coming up. I mean, look, as I look at the rest of my life, I mean, you know, who knows how much time. I mean, my father's 105, so maybe I got some more years left. We'll see. 105, and he has all of his wits about him. It's nuts, right? <laughs> but, you know, I, what at times is frightening is realizing that a change of orientation. I need to spend a lot more time with writing. I mean, I love to write, and it's a tough one. I, it, that thing is knocking on my door sometimes like nightmares saying, are you going to respond to me or not? Are you going to come here or not? Are you coming home or not? You know? And no, 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 I have other things to do. Well, you better come home, man. Forget it right now. Come and do what you got to do. So again, from the perspective of the ego, you see, the ego, it could be terrifying because you don't want to do it. And the other side is it's terrifying because it's it maybe taking you down a really bad path that was not good for your life. Wow. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, George. George, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Michael. Hey, Jorge. Hello. You are remarkable. <laughs> That's the first oh, thing you, I want you. to say. Um, I appreciate how you contrasted um, the personal significance of dream images with um, the impersonal or the transpersonal with um, um, dream images. And um, I, I suppose the subject of my question has to do with what you, um, I think you said something like, what's the storyline? What's the story like? yeah. you know the, the central motif I think you also described it as the the voice of the transcendent you know um, so um, I guess my and it's, and it's related I think to what Andrew and maybe Linda was talking about 
because some people claim that they don't dream. You know, so I'm wondering about, you know, um, dreams that are repeated. Because I think it seems to me that if you have a repeated dream, then you might have access to um, the storyline. But if you have singular dreams, that might be a little more challenging. And it's definitely more challenging if you claim that you don't have dreams. So how do you have exposure? How do you have correspondence to the storyline? So this is my question. You ready? <laughs> I was preliminary, preliminary stuff. So I was wondering, is there a correlation between um, those who dream or those who claim that they don't dream and the frequency of um, projection? I, I, I would need a lot more time to think about that one. It's a power, very powerful question about the role of projection. Uh, let me get back to that one. I, I can't respond right away. I mean, projection is a very powerful phenomenon. And, and again, Jung was ahead of his time when he talked about it. He said, because just one word about projection, Projection, he said, if you're going to have a projection, it's like if you, you, want, to, you want to put your coat on the on hook, right? On the wall. You come home, you put your coat on the back of the door. There's got to be a hook to hold it, right? Many times there ain't no hook, right? And a major thing in life, it's a big part of dream work. So connecting projection to dream is, is a great, great intuitive leap there. It's, it's totally right. Uh, because many times we project onto people things that are not, uh, not significant, not really part of their makeup. Like if you, if let's, let's say, or you dream of me after, I know it's not exactly a question, but the piece I can respond to is projection for the moment, okay? Say you dream, you come tomorrow night, you dream, or tonight you dream, Michael Conforti created a wonderful paella. He cooked paella, okay? Ma io non posso. Posso cucinare italiano, no, 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 spagnol. Okay, I, I wouldn't know how to do it. And that dream would be a projection. And I would say from the dream, you're dreaming something that I'm incapable of. And many people say, oh, it's just a dream. It's just a dream. It's just a dream. Or Aiden, you dream of Aiden and he's playing the, can you play concert piano, Aiden? Not really. No, okay. So he's doing a, a Carnegie Hall concert thing. He can't do it. He plays other stuff. He can do concerts, in, okay? And, and again, it, it's very controversial, this piece. People say it's just a dream. Well, it's not just a dream. The, the capacity for, to make accurate projections is, is huge. And it begins, as one of the famous psychoanalysts said, uh, D.W. Winnicott, the first projection we make is the infant projects onto the mother security and love and nurturance. So nine times out of 10, the faulty projection, like me cook, cooking paella tonight or whatever, or arepa, which I cannot do. I love eating though, but uh, it's a projection. It's saying most likely there was a disturbance in that in the dreamer's life in the early early years with the mother, that the 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 ability to make the projection on the mother was inaccurate because the mother couldn't satisfy those needs and it continued to proliferate making projections that don't fit. So, but but I I, I don't I don't see the correlation right. And that's why I don't want to come on the other part of it of frequency or lack of frequency of dreams and projection. Let me think about that and get back to you on it. Thank you. Uh, I can, and, if, and if that, Michael, if you get moved to, if you do think about that and want to reply, I'm happy to forward that to, I appreciate it. to Georgia, so you know. I appreciate uh, it. Michael, um, can I be bold and make a claim? Um, I think you've already done it. Yeah, <laughs> I want to hear. Um, uh, um, I think I want to hear. I'm not sure it, now. Would you, um, can, I, can I reasonably claim that um, those who don't dream um, have a tendency to project much more often? in terms of um, expressing the voice of the transcendent with regards to the expression of the voice of the transcendent? I, I, I don't have anything to base that on. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, George and uh, uh, Michael. Uh, let me go to the next person. Uh, next person is Madeline. She requests me to read out her question. She's saying, let's say that, you know, we accept um, Jung's understanding of dream that dream is telling us something about self, something about archetypical patterns. Um, you know, I know that Madeline studies Jung quite a bit. Um, so the, her question is, can somebody try to figure out their own dreams without the use of analyst? What can a person do by themselves about their dreams? Does she want to put all of us out of business? Is that the goal here? <laughs> no, no, look, of course. The skill. Now, there was a, a piece written by a guy named Wolfgang. 
Gigrich, a, a German analyst, okay? In one book called The Logical uh, Life of the Soul. I mean, one comment he made I found interesting is that when we have car trouble, we go to a mechanic usually, unless you're a great mechanic. If you have trouble with your heating system, you call a heating expert. If you got a medical problem, most likely you call a medical expert, if it's serious, right? And so what we think, well, we have a dream, or we have it's our dream, so we can work with it. And he said, you know, it is an expertise. I think uh, Andrew's question got to that a little bit before in terms of working with dreams. And that most times what we do is we will go in through the lens of the personal and stop there. If you could begin and say, okay, look, like the, like the downsizing example. If you say, look, the dream is about downsizing. Let, let me see what the issue is in downsizing. What goes with that archetypal story, okay? What's inherent in that storyline? Where am I with that story? You see, I think then one could begin doing it on their own, but I, I think the, the, the major starting point is not, uh, no, stopping, the major stopping point, I have to be able to say it that way, is not just your emotive reactions. Mm -hmm. If you stay with your emotive reactions, we're back to the opening dream of the, uh, the sailboat, right? Yep. So if you, you begin with the emotive reactions, sailboat, living in the country or, or the ants and, and the urine, whatever, you're off, you, you're probably going to be stuck in a personal. If you have your emotive reactions, okay, look, these are my reactions. Now, let me come back. What about sailboats? What about camping? What about downsizing? What, what is implicit in that story? Or like with music, say, well, you don't know what it means to move to, say, a, a, a ninth or a seventh in a chord. And you say, Aiden, could you tell us what it means? What is, well, what it means to me. I'm, I'm interested in what it means to you, but to understand that dream, if the dream is a shift, a major part of the piece of music when it moves to a ninth, a diminished ninth, say, there is something inherent in a diminished ninth. Mm -hmm. Okay? But then the dream would be telling you that it's saying most likely that particular uh, configuration is suggesting there's a major shift coming into music, the diminished ninth. It's a, it's a break of the pattern contrapuntal part of that piece of music is coming at that point, meaning in your life, you see what I mean? And that's why don't, excuse the language don't, but you know, it's, it's advisable not to stop with the emotive, have our reactions, but then say, what's, what is the storyline that goes with it? Maybe it's, maybe it's not my storyline, but what is the inherent universal storyline? Wonderful. Thank yeah. you. Can I, can I add something just quickly to that? Because um, I love this question and, and, um, and I know a little bit from from Jung uh, from Jung's point of view. It's sort of um, I think there's an in addition to what Michael's saying. It's this idea that Jung makes a, a big deal out of the fact that when we study psychology, we are both the subject and the object of our material. Yep. So when Aiden talks about Aiden, I am Aiden talking about Aiden, and I see this in his writings a lot. And I used to think it was kind of obtuse or perhaps overemphasized. But the more I think about it, it really makes sense, right? If I'm talking about me, what is the Archimedean standpoint? How do I see myself from the outside? I am me. So um, Jung even said, um, he, I think it's one of his um, writings, it's, I think he expressed some frustration that there wasn't a Jung for him to, to talk to him about his dreams, right? So I think part of taking a, a dream to an analyst is to say it's a point of reference outside of ourselves Yes, it's more educated. Yes, it understands our, they understand archetypal material and they have a really studied perspective. And on top of that, they may see blind spots that I myself cannot see because I am myself. So exactly. um, it's just a furtherance of, of, of Michael's point there. No, it's usually our frame of reference is very strong. I mean, I think it's interesting. I'm looking up. We've just been blessed by a beautiful hawk just came up here. But they never sit on the tree right outside my window here. They're good. Like a three foot walk, beautiful. It's a, I think it's a good sign. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> we, cool. we, we stay within our frame of reference. See what a complex does. A complex will, will, will limit the domain of experiences we have. It becomes smaller. Everything is viewed through that lens. And Jung said, let the archetype expand it. You know, open it up. If for you, sailboats only terror, whatever, I mean, your world gets more and more limited. If for you, the family dinner is all about wars and alcohol and fights or whatever, or it's only about the wonderful families getting together, 50 of us having dinner, 
they're, they're both, you know, they get limited. And that's where there is a universal piece that transcends our personal. Our personal is part of the big story, but it's not the whole story. And in many ways, it, I think, excuse me, I'm not maybe polite saying it this way, but when we, we insist on seeing the world through our lens and that becomes the central way we apprehend reality, it's more of an expression of fear. If you think of every act of spiritual enlightenment and spiritual experiences, there's a supplication that goes on. You get on your knees and say, I'm ready. I'm ready. What is it you want of me? What, what do you want? But when we're in control, it's because we're in control because often we're afraid of the knock on the door. Get, to get out of here. I don't want nobody at the door. I got a no disturb sign there. Well, they don't listen to it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is going to be Laura, Ron, and Barry. Laura, what's your question? Mute myself. All right. I have had a repeated dream for a while. I don't know if you need to have any context about my life. To no, just uh, keep, keep it short, Laura. Please. Okay. I had a repeated dream that my mother um, and I were having to go someplace. And can I, can I interrupt you for a second? I'd rather yeah. have any personal dreams because it reveals yes, way too that. much about the individual. Uh, it's Laura. Yes, that, that's a very good question. Uh, so a very good point, uh, Michael. Uh, Laura, we can't do any personal dreams. You can ask okay. a general question if you want. But I guess out of respect, Laura, there's respect for you. I don't want to have the dream publicly because it reveals yes. way too much. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Uh, next one is uh, Ron. Uh, Ron, Barry, and David. But was there a point to Laura's question without that? Maybe that was... We can uh, Laura, if, uh, would you be able to make that point without any personal information? Any, any general question, uh, folks? So, so that's the rule because, you know, this is educational. Uh, this is not, uh, you know, this is not, uh, you know, advice here. Uh, we can't do that. Uh, and it's not fair to you or anybody else. Uh, the privacy is important. So that's why. Um, so, Laura, do you have a general question? Uh, you need to unmute. I don't think I can generalize. I'll, I'll pass. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry about that, uh, Laura. Uh, next up is Ron. Uh, Ron, Barry, and David. Ron, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for this, Michael. It's been great. Um, yeah, my question. Oops, sorry. Uh, sorry, Ron. Uh, you need to unmute. Oh, hey. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I think you know that there's a ton of resources, especially with the internet these days, where one can look up stuff like, what does my dream mean? Or what does such and such symbol mean? And I'm wondering if you could just say a little about how you view that and how much uh, importance it is to use one's intuition before relying on that or relying on that as opposed to going to a, an expert because yeah I just find there's so much of that out there these days and a lot of friends I know just turn to that immediately to see what a symbol might have meant. No, so thank it, you. It, so, no so you're welcome it's a great question I remember one good example okay somebody had a dream a while ago of, uh, of a hummingbird and trying to put it in a cage, okay? Now, birds in a cage, obviously there's a story there, but I, I didn't, you know, I have hummingbirds outside my window. I have a lot of them and I, and I love them every day, but I never really thought about the symbol. And I went online, uh, Ron, and, and it said, and what, what I tried to do by going online was what is the dominant issue? Not just, it's about this, it's about that, but what's the dominant thing? And he said, hummingbirds generally are an expression of being able to find the nectar in life. That opened that dream up beautifully. I mean, I didn't know that part. They say the hummingbird, you know, like other birds, but especially the hummingbird with the with the beak and it goes into the thing to be able to get the nectar. It's a symbol of, of the capacity to find the nectar in life. It opened this dream up. And you know, the thing about then the person putting it in the cage, it, they were what they were putting in the cage was their capacity to find the joy, the joy de vivre of life. They were they were losing that capacity. So if you go after, I, I would say, go after with a certain intent. And the intent is, what's the dominant issue? Okay, what's the dominant theme? Like you dream of a carburetor in a car, you dream of uh, the hawk that just came by. Um, what about that? What about that animal? What are the features? And once you get the dominant theme, then you can begin saying, I wonder what it is about that issue 
that, that particular theme that the dream is wanting me to know about, okay? But so it's not like I think the Egyptian 101 dreams, a thousand dreams interpreted, whatever, it's not the point. But when, what you're searching for, I'll give the word again, you're searching for an ontological understanding or the word Dr. Kaufman uses in a wonderful book. I think I mentioned the way the image, it's a very, I'll show the book, the way the image. And what you're looking for is the Orient. Let me just grab the book here. And you're trying to get oriented as to the central core issue called The Way of the Image. It's a fabulous book, and I'll write the author down here in a second. And he's always looking for Orients. Hold on. Let's go to everybody. I don't know if it's good. I don't know. How do I write to everybody? I don't know how to do it. Uh, I'll, I'll take care of it. Oh, what okay. was the name of the author? It's uh, Y O R A M Yoram. Israeli, and last name is Kaufman, K-A-U-F-M-A-N-N. -N. Okay. And the book is called The Way of the Image. It's a fabulous, fabulous book. Wonderful, thank you. I'll, I'll put it in the- Thank chat. you, thank you. Uh, Laura, go ahead. You can go ahead and ask your general question now. You need to unmute yourself though. Okay. What if you have a dream thinking that somebody, <laughs> about somebody who you know has been dead, like let's say 50 years, and you, that person comes alive in your dream as a, as a person today? Uh, that's, a great, that's a great question. Again, the Archimedean point, okay? Somebody coming back from the dead. It's, you, could, you could look at two ways. One is you could say that it, it's something, well, dead psychologically often means it's, psychologically, the issue may be psychologically exhausted and let's go back to the unconscious, okay? So it may be a, some psychological issue that's not resolved, it is coming back, okay? That's, we'll do two sides, okay? Aiden? The two sides of the Archimedean point. One is something that had haunted you before that this person represents is coming back to haunt you again, or it may be some wonderful qualities this person has that wants to remind you of, hey, you know what, you were loved. You know, remember going out with Uncle Frank and getting the donuts every time or, or going with Aunt, with Aunt Marion and how she used to hold you as a baby? Don't forget that. that it's coming back to remind you that that, is, that that psychological experience is still alive for you somewhere. Okay? So the key would be, the, 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 the key of this story would be, who's the figure coming back? Is it, and the way I work, what helps me is to say, give me a story. Like Andrew, give me give me a story about Uncle Uncle Willie or Aunt or Aunt, Aunt Lizzie. To give me a story. Give me one or two stories that really captures what they were like with you and, and who they were in the world. Okay. That helps me a lot to get a sense of the, is it more of a generative figure in your life or something that's non-generative? Is it something that really needs to come back because you forgot about that because it is so beautiful. That one that did get you, you know, that really, really cared about you and, and maybe really spent that time with you when nobody else did. The other one that was just, you know, sort of a cruel figure, figure that didn't care enough. Is that coming back? Is the capacity not to care about yourself coming back? That tendency coming back in your life? Oh man, let him die. Let, let that energy die. Let that complex die, hopefully. Or coming back to remind you that that's still alive. Many times you find another, Laura, from your question, many times you find an ex-husband or ex-wife is coming back. We, they're, they're back in your life and you marry with them again. It's saying you probably never divorced. Maybe let's say you divorced for good reason, hopefully, right? And you may find out, you know what? The, the, that issue is still alive. It's still very much alive right now. That marriage issue that you had, that you thought you got away from, guess what? Deja vu all over again. Deja vu all over again. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Barry, David, and Lena. Uh, Barry, go ahead. So um, I think what you're uh, saying, and let me try to reword what you're saying in terms of poetry, okay. in terms of art, because that, uh, that helps me understand it. And maybe it helps me better communicate it. So uh, the key to interpreting dreams is not so much looking at it as a personal thing, but as a confluence of the divine and what makes you a better person <clears throat> towards the divine. 
So I took, uh, and that's the way I, so I look at dreams as a spiritual journey of my inner self and how I can better myself. And so you see behind me a painting I did that uh, demonstrates this painting is, uh, is on top of a wine barrel lid and it's me pairing, painting a vineyard Beautiful. Uh, of, of pinots, which are Pinot Norer. And then there is a faucet below it. Uh, the, and, the, and out of that faucet comes a wine that uh, goes into a wine glass that has my face painted on it. So it's based on this concept. The, and it's, it's really, and the question is, how do you differentiate between what is divine and what is personal in your dreams? And so I say in my poem, vine, take what is not mine, make what is mine divine, so that my dream time ferments me into fine wine. It's beautiful. I love it. And could you guys send them my address so I get a bottle of this wine, please? <laughs> All right, okay. I mean, look. If you look at the archetype of wine, let, let's try. Let's track it back to to religion. The uh, I don't know the actual origin, but one of the earliest expressions of wine we have is the transubstantiation of the body and blood of Christ from uh, from bread and wine. You know, wine is being the blood of Christ, and wine had been ceremonial from the beginning of time as a. Uh, as a celebratory experience. Now, of course, you, well, well, somebody can say, well, I eat a wine, I have an alcoholic in my family, my uncle, whatever it was. Again, we'll go back to the archetypal. Arche the wine was not made to create alcoholics. It was made to be, it was, you know, it, it's the ferment. I made it interesting. I've made wine for 15, 20 years, up to 500 gallons a year that my grandfather did. And it, it's, it's, it's pure alchemy. It's pure alchemy making wine from the fermentation process and learning about it. So in many ways, when you begin with the, the wine making process, you're involved in a very powerful spiritual alchemical uh, process where it's a conversion. It's a conversion from one substance to another. And I, the, the poem you, you, you did, Barry, is, it's beautiful. It's, it's really beautiful because you're asking for the transformation to occur through you, not because of what you want it to be. That's... In many ways, who's anybody talking about religion, spirituality? I mean, I, I think it's arrogant, but to say, from what I understand about spirituality, that's a spiritual poem, the beautiful, beautiful spiritual poem. Wonderful. Um, now, uh, Michael, how are you doing? Uh, are you uh, are you ready to take about five more questions, or is it too much, or shall we go for just hey, one? Are you a slave driver, aren't you? <laughs> it's up to you, Michael. I'm, I'm good. I'm okay. I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, Okay, uh, so uh, next up is going to be David, follow, uh, David, Lena, and Sharon. David, go ahead. Uh, folks, keep your questions brief, please. Go ahead. Hi, Michael, thank you very much for the discussion today. I found it very informative. Thank you, you're welcome. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how to frame this question, but so kind of just bear with me. Um, how do you differentiate your dreams as being, I, get, I don't know if it's correct to say genuine, or just a response to your conscious asking for unconscious help? I mean, even, okay, like I go fishing a lot, right? And say I have a, a fishing dream where maybe I, I brought, I didn't bring enough sinkers to go deeper in the water or right? whatever, okay? I mean, so, okay, that just happened the other day. Well, why would you be dreaming of it? You're dreaming of it because of significance. Remember, Freud wrote his book, Interpretation of Dream, I think in 1900, 1901, right? And he talked about the common dream, say you, you, you dream and you, you, you're all tied up, your feet are tied up. It's because your feet were caught in the sheets or that there's a war going on and you, you realize because your stomach was rumbling all night and going, you know, going topsy-turvy. See, he, he looked to limited. See, Jung is much more, you mentioned Barry is poetry and I think many people in the group are probably very, quite, uh, artistic. Jung was really an artist, an artist and a seer. He would want to know what, what's being painted and what's being told by the story of need heavier sinkers or lighter sinkers. I'm fishing, you take a tiny, tiny sinker and you, and you go. Or you say, oh, you know what? Um, the carburetor is not working that well in a car. It just doesn't sound like the carburetor is off. 
I, I take all that as, as, a, as a very important dream. It's saying something about the mixing of, of air and gasoline is not quite, the, mi the, the mixture is not quite working that well right now, okay? Well, the ref my refrigerator broke. Oh man, what a pain in the neck. Got to get a repairman, get a new fridge. Well, what's the story? The story is that which cures food by or preserves food by virtue of a, of a chilling factor is not working. So something in your capacity to chill, I don't mean like chill out, but you know, your capacity to, to, to keep things cool, maybe emotions cool or whatever, they may, that, it may be a little bit faulty. They may not be working so well right now. And it comes through the, Freud call it the day residue, the activities of the day, the, the, the residual contents of this past day so you'd be dream of it, the car, the carburetor, the, the washing machine, or the whatever. But there's still a significance to it. If, if you understand, if, if one looks at the dominant theme, what's the storyline? The brakes in the car, the washing machine, the forgetting the, the heavy weights or not having the lighter weights. There's a story. The, the key, David, from what I understand with this and what I, what I find is so helpful is to say every image is a holographic encapsulation of a much larger field. The image is, right, I think we talked last time, Aiden, do, re, mi, it, it's part of a, a sequence of a scale. So the image of, of not having a heavier weight, say, you know, like when you fish, or you need to, to go deeper, it's, that's a story. So it may not be saying the whole story, but it's saying the capacity to, to take the, something to go deeper is missing right now. That would be a huge story in your life. Or the, the image of the refrigerator that's not cooling right now. That would be a very powerful story because the story is, is a telling of a sequence of life around there are times when things need to cool and chill and freeze and other times you need to put them in the oven and heat them up. Those are all very, very powerful archetypal themes. So yeah, it may be triggered by the day's event Okay, but it is still a story because the story of the image, the image is embedded in a field and the field is telling a story. The field of going to the depth, the field of staying here, the field of chilling or whatever, the field of tradition like in Fiddle Run Roof. I just a Fiddle on a Roof, so why am I dreaming of Fiddle Run a Roof? Because there's something about tradition in your life that's coming up right now. Something about your relationship to tradition would be told by that dream. Thank you, Michael. Uh, next I think about, can, I, can I give a, qu a quick response to Srikant? Go ahead, please. Um, um, David, um, I'm going to try to be very, very quick, but in my personal experience, I used to look to dreams very, like, as for my way forward, like as a, hey, dreams help me out kind of a thing. But the, the metaphor I use for this now is like a car emergency system, right? To ask the question of, um, is my car genuine when it tells me my oil is running low? Um, my attitude may say yes or no, but if the, if, the, if the oil light turns on, I can say I can tend to it or not. It's an independent fact of my perspective. So it's like, if, if the oil light goes on, well, should I change my oil? Should I make sure that the, the thing that turns the engine, the oil light on is working, yada, yada. Let's say I ignore it. Okay, let's say uh, I run out of oil and now my engine is kind of making noise and it's rumbling and I think, well, is that genuine or not? Or is that just a response? Okay. I can think about it, but let's say the tire pressure goes down. Now I'm on the highway, got low tire pressure, my engine's not working and I'm out of oil. I'm gonna crash. It's totally independent of my perspective. It's, it's like I'm in a dangerous situation and sometimes we have to crash to take it seriously. But my point is yeah. it's a whole other system on the other side of that, of that yeah. car emergency system. So whether or not I take it as genuine or not, the car doesn't matter or the car, the car doesn't care whether I take it seriously or not. I mean, it's going to, it's going to do its own thing. So to me, understanding the unconscious is a way of saying, Hey, there's really a thing over there. That's great. It's a great image. Yeah. And I really want you're to know. What the, you're getting the indicators, the indicator lights go on oil radiator, whatever. And saying, yeah, I mean, you do with it whatever you want to, but most likely if you have reason to trust it, then you, you see, yeah, it's, it's giving you some accurate information. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, great image. Um, so I, I just want to make one uh, com comment slash question, and then we'll do breakout rooms, and then we can come back and take our do our takeaways. So 
uh, Michael, this was really enlightening because this, I had not really thought much about dreams, but I'm, I've spent a lot of time looking at Jung's approach as opposed to other people's approach to the psyche. Jung's approach is characterized by focus on the self, you know, focus on the universal, sure. you know, and that's really the heart of his approach. And what you're trying, what he's always trying to do is to kind of get to that. And he's considering everything else in the middle as being kind of distractions and that are going to send you elsewhere. Uh, and you're, so it's like, so there is the self archetypes, the universal, uh, the, the spirit, the, the God, if you will, kind of in the middle. And then on the lay or top, you have these layers of your complexes or uh, your reactions, your system one, uh, your habits. And those are very loud in the sense that those are the things that you're going to hit first. And you kind of have to look at the core and what he seems to be saying through all his work is that look at that core, yeah. connect with that core, get to that. And all his approach to dreams seems to be saying, look for those things. Get to that core. Don't, don't get distracted by, does that, does that- um, It's an 80% accurate. I think the only fine tuning Mm -hmm. is it, it's not about distraction. I mean, the, the, the opening story I gave about the, the two sailboat dreams, mm -hmm. it's not a distraction for the patient to have those two, the Grecian piece and then the terrible tragedy piece. They're not distracted, that's life. I mean, life happens. But the point is many times, I mean, look, life happens in ways that trauma happens and that the trauma will constrict. Like, you know, when you get a terrible headache, Mm -hmm. and, and it's because many times it's the blood vessels are constricting and they give you cafragot or other kinds of medicine to open them up you have some coffee have some coffee open them up they constrict the complex will constrict and narrow your perspective Beautiful. because that's all you see all you see understandably look I, without saying to me i grew up with a lot of traumas in cars terrible 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 things in cars mm -hmm. for years without even knowing i'd get into a car i'd start a fight with somebody or I I'd I'd go crazy. I'd be nervous. You're too fast, too slow. Watch out! Watch out! So, so somebody finally said, "What the hell is it with you, cars?" Said, oh right, there was a story there. I kind of forgot about that one. But it was all. You see what I mean? It's all through the lens. So it's not a distraction. It's it's a way to deal with an issue, but to then understand there's a difference. Yes, cars, issues, sailboats, and then there's the archetype itself. So it's not a distraction. You're hundred percent there, really, but it's not a distraction. It's the need to make a distillation, to really be able to distill and see the difference in relationship. Sometimes they're not related. It's your experience. Look, you know, one of the, the central motifs in mythology is hubris and inflation. When, when we will only see the dream through what I think, I think a vine means this, I think this means that, okay, that's wonderful. Real spirituality is, again, supplication, getting on your knees and saying, look, let, let me be, I'm sure there are many great expressions, you guys know the Bible better than me, but you say, let me be touched by something bigger. Let me be open to something. And we, when the voice of the complex continues, like the blood vessels constricting, constricting and all you can see, a little piece, you, all you see, all you see is what's in front of you. All you see is what you've been through. All I saw with the car, the car, excuse me, the car things as a kid. That's all I saw for a while. Until Beautiful. you work it. And then, then it like, it's like getting a snow plow to, to plow your way to get to the house. You get to the house, then you can have experiences in the home. You see what's there. Wow. Bake your bread, have your meal, have your friends. You know, celebrate Beautiful. your family. Beautiful, uh, Michael. All right, folks. So I'm going to start the breakout rooms now so we can discuss these ideas amongst ourselves. And we'll be back here in 20 minutes to talk about our takeaways, starting the breakout rooms now. Welcome folks, welcome back everybody. Welcome back. So it's time for takeaways. I'm gonna give a chance for people who had put exclamation mark before to share your takeaways. If you wanna share your takeaways, go ahead and put an exclamation mark again. Uh, I'm gonna start with Judith, Marco and Sarika. Uh, so just uh, be brief about one to two minutes of takeaways. So let's start with Judith. Judith, go ahead. 
Oh, well, I guess I'll just ask where we left off a, a half a second ago. Um, if Michael would um, kindly expand on uh, house dreams and their significance, and maybe that's, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Judith. Uh, next up is going to be, uh, let's see, uh, Marco, Sarika, Fika, and Barry. Marco, what's your takeaway? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess it was more of a question, but um, basically, like, um, like if uh, I can't wrap my head around the archetypes, so I was wondering if it could further define that, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marco. Next up is Sarika, Fika, and Barry. I was actually really lucky to have Michael in the breakout room with me, but I wanted to ask if you recommend any, um, if you have a book recommendation. Okay. I'm taking my notes here too. Okay. Wonderful. And uh, I'm going to put the Amazon link to uh, the book that he, uh, Michael recommended, uh, The uh, Way of the Image. And many people have recommended that book to me. So I just went ahead and bought it and I've started reading it. Uh, while while you guys were in the breakout room. So it, it looks amazing. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Fika, Barry, and Andrew. Fika? Um, yes, hi. And in our group, we, we, uh, we did think, uh, talk about problem solving in dream state. And um, one thing that I was interested in knowing was uh, sleep paralysis. If there's room to talk about that now or later on, I, I would be very interested to learn. Thank you. Okay. Michael, where are you from originally? Afghanistan. Okay, welcome. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Faika. Next up is going to be Barry. Let me see. Uh, yeah, Barry, go ahead. Yes, uh, I want to tell you, Michael, you really helped me a lot in the last two times I've met you because you have really taught me, like it says in the Bible, you can't serve God and mammon at the same time. And if you're on a spiritual journey, uh, somebody that's on a material journey, you cannot go on the same journey. And I just want to leave you with a poem that I read last Wednesday. It's very short because it fits in with what you said about a sailboat. It's called Life Sea. Direct mind's rudder, give life direction. Float when the sea's rough, life goes at all directions. Follow the sea's current, life goes nowhere. Float when the sea's calm, life comes to a stop. Gets set sails without a rudder, life goes with the wind. Direct rudder with a compass, life comes to fruition. Need the very last line, please. The very last one. I said, uh, direct uh, life goes. Well, okay, direct rudder with a compass, life comes to fruition. Oh my love it. Could you send me that reference somehow? You you got my you got the CC email. You've been a no, I wrote that. That's my poem. Well, you wrote it. Well, well send me the poem. I mean, sure. Um, <laughs> a beautiful poem. Aiden, could you put um, Michael's email address or a CC email address in the chat? Or you can send it to me and I can forward it. Um, okay. What, what would you like, Michael? Um, you can forward it. That's fine. But if we can't. I'm writing it, a book of my poems and paintings. And I want everybody to buy my book and when it comes out. <laughs> oh, so this is a public publicity. Oh, I got it. Okay. okay. <laughs> got it. Uh, next up is going to be uh, Hannah, followed by Andrew. Hannah. Uh, Hannah, do you have the mic? Okay. It says, uh, she says, uh, Youngian analysts actively guide patients to find the archetypes and story on their own or does the analyst suggest specific archetypes or interpretations? So it's a question. Uh, so about that, okay. Next up is uh, Andrew. So anybody else who wants to share their takeaways can go ahead and type exclamation mark. Uh, Andrew, go ahead. I wanna say that I'm someone who uh, I figured I'll study Jung and completely rely on intellect alone. And I think what Michael made me realize I'm not as independent as I thought, and we do need help. We, need, we do need people and intellect is just, is empty. Uh, if, if, if it's just on your own, reading books on your own, that's not enough. And I think Michael really made me realize that, that you need some guidance, some help, some for being alone on your own reading books won't do it. All right, uh, uh, folks, if there are no other takeaways, this is the last chance. I'll give you about 10, 15 seconds 
to type uh, exclamation mark or raise your hand in Zoom. Actually, Otherwise, we're going to- I'm going to put something in the chat as well. Speaking of um, self-promotion. Um, yes, please. Go ahead. I've, I've just started a group uh, for uh, in regards to my coaching practice that is a group that is, um, I put resources for um, personal development. This video will be on there as well as other things I've encountered um, in analytical psychology and, and in my coaching uh, experience. So um, there's no charge to join. There's no expectation. It's just something I'm sharing with people in my circle. So I'm gonna put that in the um, chat here and feel free to find me there as well if you wanna continue any dialogue with me personally. Perfect, perfect. Uh, thank you, Aiden. So, uh, Michael, would you like to respond to any of them? I, I'm particularly interested in the book recommendations to start with. Well, Kaufman, yes, Kaufman number one. Kaufman number one. If you're interested, my books are now in over three, four languages. Um, the first book, oh, there is in Russian. There's, thank you, and I book in Russian. It's also in Italian, but. It, the first book I wrote is called Feel, Form, and Fate. I think it's a very good introduction to the, not intro, but it's a, it's a pretty solid background to this work, Feel, Form, and Fate. And we're working on, on the Russian on that now. Um, <clears throat> read Von Franz. I mean, Von Franz is clearly one of the best. Um, <clears throat> her book on dreams is fantastic. So I, I would say Kaufman, Von Franz on dreams, and then... Uh, a powerful book that Jung wrote is Archetypes in a Collective Unconscious. He, he, he's a little tougher to read, but it, it's, a, it's a very powerful book and a good read. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, would you like to respond to any of the other or do you have yeah, a, a couple of them? Yeah. House dreams, as I think it was Judith asking, house dreams, it's a huge issue. Houses, if you think about it, what house, house is where we live, where we live. A house psychologically often is symbolic of the place where we live our psychological life. And sometimes you dream of a house that's too small. I was saying in the breakout room, house is too big. Sometimes, as Judith mentioned, you dream of discovering, oh my God, I never knew. There's a whole other part of the house. I never knew it. Who knew? And it, it's saying most likely the dreamer is becoming aware or they need to become aware. Probably they need to become aware. And guess what? You got a lot more, got a lot more living to do. You know how that song goes. But there's a lot more, a lot of other parts you, you never knew about. Maybe other than other wings to the house that are undiscovered. Um, so I would take a dream of that very seriously in terms of the nature of the house, the the style of the home. Is it a comfortable home? Is it heated? You know, all the things to see as a story of what is the psychological space we're living in. Is it a well heated, ventilated? Is it a wonderful place? Do we have views? Are we living in a little box? The first house I bought, real quick, it had no windows. It had little portholes. I said, what the heck is going on? They said, well, the guy who designed it was a submarine captain. <laughs> <laughs> I really think it was a joke, but it was true. So my first thing I did when he went to bought the house, it had a lot of acres, right? So I bought the house and I knocked out all the walls and put giant windows. I had to have windows. So that would be saying the, the, the vistas are pretty narrow when you first move into that kind of structure, okay? Because they're so small. The thing about um, the archetypes, whether you, you're guided by the analyst or the analyst has a sense of it, a lot of it is it's the personality of a therapist, okay, number one. But, but I think the, the key issue is there are, there are dominant archetypes in someone's life, or there will be a dominant archetype at a different phase of your life. You know, like my son and his wife, as they prepare for a child, I mean, their life is galvanized around parenting right now, impending parenthood, as it needs to be. And the analysts would help them when, when you see their complexes, maybe their experiences with the fathers and mothers, or whatever, interfere with the ability to do it well or, or whatever. So that's what you work with. So, but, but the, the, and the central point I want to say about that question, which is important, very important one, is from one's life and from one's dream and one, from, from your proclivities in life to find what is the central dominant archetype that's guiding. And there probably is one. In the same way, in astrological sense, there's a there's a dominant uh, dominant constellation. While there are inter not only interfere, but there are you know different influences. There's often a central dominant, yeah. And it's a gift because once you understand that, 
your life is different because then you could be in service of, of furthering your destiny in line with what is in fact the authentic destiny of your life. You're growing tomatoes, you're growing broccoli, you're growing eggplant. Each of them need different things to grow. And if you know you're growing a garden of eggplant, you know, whatever you particularly say, being an analyst or Andrew is a physicist or um, Aiden is a musician, now therapist or whatever, Marina learn, you know, learning another language, whatever. I mean, it, it really helps you be oriented how to live your life and how to, how to respond to the mandates of that, of that initiative. It, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah. Um, uh, I couldn't hear F F Fika's uh, question. I couldn't hear it too well. So I'm, I, I apologize for that. I cannot respond to that. Home dreams, archetypes. Barry's piece about the the poem that you wrote. I think it's it's a it's a wonderful poem which captures the the need to respond to these archetypal dynamics in life. And you see what I love in the at the end is if you follow if you do the rudder and the compass, you see the compass is saying there is due north somewhere. So even though you know in, in nautical charts, for instance, due north has shifted about fifteen degrees in the past three years. You know that, Barry. Do north has shifted. So they're having to redo nautical maps. You know that, Andrew, as a physicist? There's been a shifting. So the point is, while it's shifted 15 degrees, there still is a due north. It's a frightening shift, but yes. What's that? It's a frightening shift, complete the, shift. Yeah, see, I don't know. I don't really understand what it means. I mean, I'm sure you know a lot more, and I'd love to hear about that at some point, what it, what it really means and what's going on in the world. Um, I mean, it's very powerful. Like many times when you hear about the dolphins or whales are beached, it's because there's a shifting of the, of the magnetic poles. So anyway, um, what I love about the poem is they're saying, if one can capture what is in sense due north, even if it's 15 degrees different today, there is still a due north for everybody. So there is a destiny fact of our lives. And part of the, I think one of the greatest gifts, if somebody can help you identify the, the destiny of your life, not, you know, to find out what, what's yours, you know, what, what is your piece? Yeah. All right, Michael, this was wonderful. Uh, Aiden, do you have any uh, concluding remarks? Oh, just a huge thank you again, Michael. It's always a pleasure for me personally. And, uh, and I, I know the group enjoys having being with you here today. So um, thank you for coming back um, sincerely. And um, I've got the ACC, um, there's a couple of links ACC related in the chat, both in terms of the, the, the um, conference he was talking about in terms of complex and uh, the myth uh, that he's using in that teaching. And you can find a lot of information on the ACC Institute from those links as well. So um, please check that out. And thank you so much, Michael. Uh, Michael. Thank you. Can, can I make one last pitch too? Yes, I mean, please. Thank you for putting the website. The, the dream conference is coming up and uh, Three of the, of the, I think seven lectures, we're gonna have them in uh, three or four different languages. So that's gonna be very exciting. Wonderful, cool. and, and the link to that is in the uh, chat, right, uh, Aiden? Yes, and I'll put it one more time just for the sake of ease here. 